If you're interested in piano chords, songwriting or music production, then you need to know the 1564 chord progression. 1564, and, and it's what I'm playing right now, is a powerful harmonic tool that is used in literally thousands of songs. So today I'm going to show you what 1564 is, why it's so powerful, and give you a toolkit of cool things that you can do with it on your piano or keyboard. Along the way we're going to be talking about cadences, bass lines, chord voicing, slash chords, melodic structure, um, chromatic medium passing chords, whatever they are, and a whole bunch of other stuff. Let's get going. Okay, so let's take a super quick overview of the basic music theory we're going to use here. 1564 is a major key chord progression. Any key has seven basic chords. It's diatonic chords that we can grow out of the scale of that key. Those chords all have names, but we can also give them numbers. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and then back to 1 at the top of the scale. So 1, 5, 6, 4 is just a chord progression that uses the 1st, 5th, 6th, and 4th chords of a major key in that order. And it will always be a major chord, followed by another major chord, then a minor chord, and then a major chord. Now if all of that music theory is new to you, then after the tutorial, check out the links and resources I've put in the description text below the video. And also feel free to ask me any questions, however basic they seem, down there in the comments. Okay, it gets pretty boring when everything's in C major all the time, so let's go into F major instead. Now in F, the basic 156 four chords are F, C, D minor and B flat. What I'm going to do is play through the 1564 progression in a really simple way in F major in 4-4 four, four time with two beats on every chord. Later in the tutorial I might pull that timing about a bit. You might hear me coming in ahead of the beat a lot of the time, but for now we'll keep the timing very straight because there are a couple of important things that I want to show you. Here goes. And again, look at the way I'm shaping the right hand chords. This is a really important thing if you're just starting out with this kind of stuff. We don't just play right hand chords in this shape, in the root position with the note that the chord is named after as the lowest note. We don't do that all the time by any means. Rather, we reorder the notes in the chords to use shapes that flow naturally into one another so that we don't have to jump too much. There's D minor going to B flat. Now that's not just to save us the bother of jumping, but also because those interlocking shapes with lots of shared notes sound much more kind of natural and logical and musical. Now sometimes you can jump. You don't have to stay in, this, stay in the same position all the time, but it's best to avoid a lot of successive jumps. This time I'm going to play the same shapes in the right hand, but do something a little bit different in the left. I'm going to go like this. F, C with an E in the bass, D minor, B flat. Let me do that again. F, C over E, D minor, B flat. Now what I did there is very common in a 1-5-6-4 progression. On the second chord, the 5, the C, instead of using the root note of the chord in the bass, I used its third the E. That note is still in the C chord, but it's not the root. We would write that as a slash chord. C slash E. C over E, signifying C with an E in the bass. Now this is a big deal, because using that E in the bass does two things. First of all, it gives us a more flowing bass line. We're just going down the scale, in the left. If you wanted, you could even drop in a passing note on that C. Secondly, that slash chord changes the character of the chord. The bass note has a massive effect on any chord, and this chord, this C chord, still does the same job. It's still a C, still a five chord in F major, but it's different. It's kind of hard to describe, but it's more kind of finely balanced, more on edge, more delicate than just a regular solid five chord with the root in the bass. It also seems to flow more naturally into the D minor chord. So as well as getting a different kind of bass line, using the slash chord gives us a different kind of sound.
Okay, hold that thought, because we need to think about some more music theory for a couple of minutes, and in particular about the cadences in the 1564 progression. By the way, if you're finding this tutorial useful so far, please do hit that like button. I always really appreciate it when people do that. Anyway, in theoretical terms, 1564 can work really well as part of a larger progression. You could go 1, 5, 6, 4, but then 2, 5, 3, 4, or something like that. But equally, it works really well as part of a loop. And there are plenty of songs that just use 1564 as part of a 4 bar or a 2 bar loop, repeating it over and over again, maybe with a variation for a bridge passage or a chorus or whatever. As you can see, hopefully, 1564 actually loops really naturally, and that makes it handy for practicing piano improvisation, but also brings out some of its interesting harmonic features that we can really exploit, and that's where cadences come in. Now, the word cadence causes a lot of confusion, but really it just describes the effect when one chord leads to another, or resolves to the other, to use the technical term, in a particular way. The most obvious and famous cadence is the authentic cadence, which we also call the 5-1, or the dominant tonic resolution. It describes the way that the fifth chord of the key, the dominant chord, tends to resolve to pull very strongly towards the first chord, the tonic chord. So in F major, that's C resolving to F. 5-1 dominant tonic, authentic cadence. Like I said, the authentic cadence is the most common, the most famous cadence in all Western music. It is really, really fundamental. But, and here's the kicker, we don't have one. We don't have a 5-1 authentic cadence in a 1-5-6-4 chord progression. And that's one of the things that makes 1-5-6-4 so expressive and so powerful. The lack of an authentic cadence gives that little progression a sense of never-ending movement and change. There are also three other types of cadence in a looped 1-5-6-4 that contribute to that feeling. Let's go through them. So when we go from 1 to 5, that's a half cadence, that gets things going. It's not especially interesting in itself, but it sets us up for the point at which the fun really begins when we go from five to six. Now that's what we call a deceptive or interrupted cadence because when you're on that five chord, what your ear really expects is an authentic cadence, five, one. But instead, it gets five, six. Okay, keeps things very much in the air, it's not what your ear expects. And then that 6 goes to 4, and those two don't really have much of a cadential relationship. So the next important one happens when the progression loops, and we go from 4 at the end of one loop to 1 at the start of next. 4, 1. Subdominant chord to tonic chord. Now that's called a plagal cadence, or an Armen cadence, or a church cadence because it's it's really common in church music. Pop has really deep roots in church music, by the way. It's a really interesting kind of uh, thing to think about. Let me just have another quick noodle through the one five six four in F major, rather in the same vein as I did at the start of the tutorial. I'll take it quite slowly and I'll just go through the four chord progression twice. So hopefully you'll be able to see what I'm doing pretty clearly. Here we go. Could you see that I was using my basic interlocking chord shapes, as we discussed earlier in the tutorial, so I'm not doing lots of jumping, but there were also lots of other notes in there, notes that didn't belong in the chords that I was playing. So at the start, when I had the F chord, I went up to this D and held it over to the C chord with the E in the bass. So in effect, I created an F6 chord and a C add 9 over E, if you want to think about it in those terms. Then I kept that C and used it as a little suspension going into the B flat chord. Yeah. Then I put this G in the F chord. 
Then going into the, because I'm back at the start of the uh, the loop now, then I held the F into what would ordinarily be the C chord next to create a C sus chord with that very, very distinctive C sus sound, which I, I really love. Because I wanted to create that C sus sound, I deliberately left the E out of the chord, which would be too much of a clash, okay? So C sus. Then I took the E and the G from what would be the underlying C chord and held them into the D minor chord, which I made into a D minor seven chord, I think. Yeah, to create a D minor 11. Okay, and that took us quite neatly to quite a clean B flat chord at the end there. So what's going on when I play something like that? Well, first of all, let me tell you what's definitely not going on. When I sit down at the piano to improvise over a 1564 or any chord progression, I'm not thinking to myself, oh, I know, you know, I'll make a, an F6 here and a C add 9 here, then I'll make this change and this change, and then I'll make the C a C sus chord and, and, and all the rest of it. Occasionally, very occasionally, that kind of conscious thinking might happen, like when I consciously decide to take the E out to make the C sus chord, but it doesn't happen very much. I'm not being too conscious, I'm not being very analytical. Instead, I'm letting my fingers do the thinking. I'm kind of feeling around for other notes, adding them to the chords, yeah, maybe sometimes holding notes from one chord to another, creating a new sound by actually moving my fingers less, yeah, and judging the results with my ears. When I play around with those extra notes that aren't in the basic chords, really I'm doing two things. First of all, I'm creating bits of melody, which I might be able to use later, yeah, but also the chords, as we've seen, are kind of changing under my fingers as I play them. I'm adding extensions like that F6 and that D minor 11. Extensions are effectively just notes stacked on top of the basic chords, yeah? I've also got these suspensions where I'm holding a note from chord to chord. And also I'm doing little decorations of the chord, just very simple movements like this, these little motifs that don't usually include a lot of movement, but add character and which can also be the beginnings of melody. Now, if you want to start doing stuff, uh, you might want to play it safe to start with just by adding some very basic extensions. A really good one is to add a seventh on the sixth chord of the one, five, six, four. So that would be F, C, D minor seven, it's quite elegant, you see, because we've got the C chord and we're just holding that C at the top while we play the D minor, basic D minor shape underneath to create a D minor seven. Another really nice one is to add a major seventh to the four chord. So the four chord is B flat, a major seventh would be an A there. Let's try that again. F, C over E, D minor seven, B flat major seven, okay? Notice again, I haven't actually done much different. If anything, I've moved less, yeah? So I've got the D minor seven chord, and then I'm just shifting down to the B flat for the B flat major seven chord. As is so often the case, I'm doing more by moving less. Another really powerful tool that you have in the 1564 toolkit is the bass line. Okay, you can do a lot of really interesting stuff in the bass on a 1564, and that's because of the sheer number of shared notes that you have between those four chords, as we've seen when we've been playing around in the right hand. So you could start with an F chord but with a C in the bass. F over C, a slash chord, okay, and then hold that C in the bass for the C chord that comes next, yeah? The tonic chord, F, with C in the bass like that, a fifth in the bass, a second inversion chord, to use a technical term, sounds really kind of intense, really kind of epic, yeah? Or you could develop that even further, you could do something like this, um, F, C over G, because a G appears in the C chord, D minor over A, B flat, and then join up to your F over C, C over C, then D minor coming up the scale again, and then B flat over D, 
yeah? Or all I'm doing really there is coming up the F major scale, yeah? And using the shared note to create an interesting bass line. There's really a ton of stuff you can do there, so make sure you play around with it a little bit. Okay, so earlier I said we were gonna look at some more rocket science-y stuff like passing chords and chromatic medium passing chords, which sound kind of technical, but they're not really, and you can actually have quite a lot of fun with them. Let me show you what they are. What I'm gonna do is play through the 1564 progression one more time, but this time I'm gonna double up on the timing, yeah? So instead of having two beats per underlying chord, I'm gonna play four beats per underlying chord, which is gonna give us some room for some passing chords. Here we go, I'll keep it really simple. Hopefully that was pretty clear, yeah? So I went from F to C as normal, but instead of playing a full four beats on the C chord, on the final beat, I dropped in this A7 over C sharp. I could have just played a C sharp diminished chord, but I went for A7 over C sharp. Now, A7 is one of the chromatic mediant chords in the key of F major. A chromatic mediant is basically either the third or the sixth chord of the key, the mediant and the submediant to give them their technical names, with their tonality inverted, so made major rather than minor, possibly with added sevenths, and sometimes flattened or sharpened, though that hasn't happened here. Okay, so chromatic mediants like A7 are non-diatonic, but they flow smoothly from diatonic progressions and can often add a little bit of wow, a little bit of drama to a progression, or sometimes kick off a key change. So what I'm doing here is taking the third chord, A minor, the mediant, and making it major, adding the seventh, A7, and very conveniently, A7 would be the dominant chord for D minor, the key of D minor if you like, but it resolves really strongly to the D minor chord. Okay, you might say we've changed key, and yeah, maybe we have, but D minor is only the relative minor of F major, so it's not much of a key change at all, but it's a really cool effect. Then from the D minor, I put in another passing chord, a C, on the way to the B flat. Now that one seems a bit simpler because it's completely diatonic, but actually it's really, really cool because what I've done, if you think about it, is add another deceptive cadence, another interrupted cadence to the progression. We go from D minor, we hear the very quick C, and our ear expects that C to resolve to the tonic, F. But instead it doesn't, we get the interrupted cadence, the deceptive cadence, whatever you want to call it, and it goes to the B flat. Okay, and then we've got the lovely, if we're looping, the lovely plagal cadence. Now, if you think all this 1564 stuff is cool and interesting, I think you're really going to like my books and my piano packs. Right now, I have a bundle deal running on the ebook versions of my three current books How to Really Play the Piano, Seven Studies in Pop Piano, and An Introduction to Cocktail Piano. And that bundle deal is just £18.95 for all three ebooks, which is a 30% saving on what you would normally pay for them. Seven Studies in Pop Piano is going to be especially useful if you're interested in this kind of playing. It is a set of seven piano pieces starting easy and getting steadily more challenging that really picks apart the pop style with lots of notes ideas explanations and things like that you can also buy it separately and in fact as a hard copy as well and there is a link in the description text for that below but like i said seven studies is great value as part of the bundle deal you can find out more about the bundle by visiting billspianopages.com bundle by clicking the little youtube card that's going to pop up in the right hand corner right about about now or by looking for the link in the description text below. And then there's my piano packs. Now these are six PDF packs with accompanying videos that I originally created for my Patreon supporters. They're full of exercises and original pieces and other useful stuff to help your piano learning. Each one is a dozen pages long and really, really jammed with useful stuff. Plus it has that full walkthrough video for each one. Everyone on my Patreon has really enjoyed the piano packs and I think you will as well. You still get them at no extra charge if you sign up to support me on Patreon, by the way 
the links below, but now you can buy them as a one-off for £16.95. Just head to buildspianopages.com slash pianopacks, or once again, click the YouTube card in the top right-hand corner, or you'll find a link to all the products that I'm talking about today down in the description text underneath the video. So what do you do now? Well, I've given you a bunch of tools that you can use with your 1564s and of course with other chord progressions, but 1564 is superb for practicing this stuff, yeah? Because it's so beautiful, really. So go and sit at your piano or keyboard and just kind of play around. See what you can do and remember always to listen to what you're doing. What sounds good is what matters. Don't get stuck in a heavily analytical approach to music making. And if you come up with something that sounds good, please do let me know. Post a recording, add a link in the description text below and I will be absolutely delighted to listen and give you some feedback. Also let me know, like I said earlier, if you have any questions because I absolutely love discussing this stuff in the comments. There we go. Oh look, here is a clickable on-screen link to my piano pack deal what a coincidence go and hit that link right now check out the piano pack deal but then get yourself to your piano and start playing around with one five six four i'll see you next time